Nation and helping us live victoriously for the last 21 years. Alright, oh, that's it. That's you know a word to the sponsor. That's it. Enough of that. <laughs> this session has been very important to my heart. Mentorship is definitely a cornerstone of the industry. And this session is based on a book uh, called Letters to a Young Scientist. And basically, the scientist wrote to his younger self about the pitfalls that he could um, bypass in his life. And you know, we all know hindsight is a real bitch, right? You know, if only. Um, I bumped into a bartender um, in Atlanta uh, about six years ago, and she said to me, you know, I come to sales, and I would love the opportunity uh, to meet some of my mentors so that I can really find out uh, where, I go, where I should go next in my career. Uh, she said, but the only problem with that is they're all on these panels, and at the end, you never get the opportunity to really see them or engage with them. So we came up with the idea to have a panel where you meet industry, uh, industry mentors and they write a letter to their younger self. And there's some uh, mentors, some amazing mentors in the room actually, in the crowd, uh, who helped start, who helped kickstart this. Jackson Cannon, of course. Round of applause for Jackson. Sean Kenyon. Miss Judy Reiner, thank you all so much. And of course, Jacques, yeah, yeah. You got the tequila, bro. <laughs> and this session is um, it's really reflective, and it's really quite hard for uh, one to write a letter to their younger self, as I found out over the last few years. I remember when I uh, first wrote my letter, uh, one of the um, pieces of advice I always give to young bartenders, obviously, is get involved, bro. <laughs> Uh, but apart from that, I also say to them, you know, specialize um, in something and come um, from a place of humility uh, because it's really important to be humble um, in this industry and don't believe your own hype and just learn and engage with as many people as you can. And it's really helped um, a lot of people um, over the years. I was lucky to have had an amazing uh, mentor when I started my career. Um, Manolis, God bless his soul, in a small little bar in Greece, um, and he uh, really taught me um, a lot about the industry and why and how we uh, all come to bars and engage in bars and how we build a really hospitable um, community. Now today we've got an amazing panel, another amazing panel of mentors who are going to read their letters to you, and I'm going to start by just passing the mic around uh, the horn and they're just going to tell you just a little bit about themselves and we're going to get straight into reading the letters and at the end we're going to have some Q&A's. So we're going to try and make this really quick so that at the end you can ask some questions of these mentors. Please feel free to make, take notes and ask them whatever you wish because maybe you only chance you're going to get at tails. So please, Nectali, you can start. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Natalia Mendoza from Las Vegas. I'll give him a round of applause. Yes, that's it. Natalia Mendoza from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I own Herbs in the Rye, and we just opened our second property, uh, Cleaver. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 20 years now. Don't age yourself, though. That's a lot. That's a lot. You still look young. Yeah, I feel great. Yeah, I feel great. Um, been in the industry about 20 years, um, and my whole career has kind of uh, started off a little bit of a mistake. Um, long story short, uh, a buddy of mine got a job at the Bellagio. Uh, while they were building it, uh, I got the phone number, called it, went for an interview. The lady left me in a cubicle for nine hours. She felt so bad for me that she gave me the job. <laughs> so fuck. <laughs> And uh, around with it, I made a career out of it, so here we are. <laughs> here we so, uh, <laughs> everything's a blessing, my friends. Everything's a blessing in life. Thank you. So, uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel with uh, great people. So, uh, welcome back. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bridget? Is it fun? Yeah, it's fun. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Bridget Albert. Woo-woo! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> my family and I made. Um, I also work for Southern 
Legislature's Mind and Spirits, and I'm the National Director of, Ed of Education for Dean Centauri, so I'm, I'm quite busy. Um, <laughs> um, my story is uh, kind of fun. My grandmother was a bar back. Uh, she died uh, two years ago at the age of 91, and she was a bar back for her mother, and for her mother's mother, and my great great aunt to leave on the bar about an hour south from where I live in Cole City, Illinois. There's no reason for anyone in this room to know where Cole City, Illinois is. <laughs> And uh, the bar closed in like, the 1960s. So, um, but I grew up with our studies, and I have photos and some relics. And um, I went to college for five seconds, and I hated it. <laughs> I can't do math or spell, maybe. Um, but I can make a cocktail next to my grandmother. So it's in my blood. It's all that I know and what I love to do. And I too have had um, the most wonderful mentor um, on the planet. His name is Tony Avogadro. That I met yep. in Las yep. Vegas. <laughs> And he's been my, I, I tell him that he's my mentor of, of my lifetime. Someone I talk to every single week, I talk to him this morning, um, and someone that I go to frequently when I feel like I've lost my path. So I'm happy to be here with these five gentlemen and with all of you this morning. And uh, thank you for having me. This is so cool. Thank you for being here, my love. Douglas Sandra. Guys, <laughs> how are you? My name is Tabu Sankar from London. I said, you can stand up. You can stand up. I always do that anyway. Um, this is, um, I've got all my friends' mentors in the room, so it's been difficult for me to kind of express myself, but I'll do my best. I've been working in bars, writing bars, in bars for the last, I've got 10 years in here, but for the last 32 years. <laughs> yeah. A few gray hairs there, but I've been here for quite a while. I started my career very much so in a hard work cafe in London, where I first met Colin. Yeah, we were at school together. Okay. Yep. And you um, told me to get into it, and I said no. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. um, when I started working in bars, I didn't see his career. It was very much a stopgap. And I thought I'd do for the summer, and then go back to college. But you know, I liked it. You know, the money was great. I made some great friends, so I kind of stayed and carried on. Through that, I uh, worked a few bars, management bars in London. Then I set up a school with this young man called the London Academy of Bartender in 1996. So for me, it's been a long time. So career for me is not something that I see. I actually enjoyed the way. Okay. From the school, we opened our first bar called The Lab. You know? And Lab was very, very infamous. Still has been there quite a few times. <laughs> if, 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 if I should call some great guys who even worked at Lab. Now, at the own bar, Ross out of Arizona. Yeah, so, Ross! Okay. Uh, from there, I opened my second bar, bar called Lab. That's sorry, Townhouse, I'm saying. That's where the Pong Star Marty was created by me in 2003. Yeah. Anyone have, enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's a bit about me. We've got most by Let's take <laughs> and listen, the me next man needs no introduction, so please, go uh, ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Tim Zinkoff, and... Uh, oh, yeah. 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 All right. uh, yeah. By the way, he's being very, very uh, humble because he was one of the pioneers of the London Cocktail This man said, I know something. Anyway, the, uh, the most important thing I'm doing in my life right now is uh, making and curing sausage <laughs> my son in Rhode Island and my family. And, uh, it, it is really important. Things to <laughs> but I had a mentor to his name was Joseph Baum. He was a miserable son of a bitch. But I got on with him, and we, without him, I wouldn't have a career. Uh, and I'm going to wait for the letter to take it rest. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, feel free, actually, if you wish to, you know, record this session. Um, make sure you tag um, Greg News. Uh, make sure you tag all of the uh, panelists and share it away. And, of course, uh, get involved, bro. I mean, shameless plug on my end. It's okay. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to start uh, with you next, Ali, if that's okay. <coughs> if you could read your letter, that would be cool. Awesome. Thank you, sir. I just didn't want to go after Dale. Oh, you didn't want to go after Dale? Okay, no, I wouldn't want to go after Dale. Awesome. 
All right, uh, mine is called Raising the Bar by Looking Beyond It. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, I started off in the service industry 22 years ago in Las Vegas. I was blessed enough to get an interview at the Bellagio through a good friend of mine. So after I completely bombed the interview because uh, I didn't know shit about anything, I was uh, told to wait in a cubicle. After uh, many hours, uh, the lady who interviewed me came back. She felt so bad for me that she forgot me there. Uh, she hired me. She asked me why I waited so long, and my response was simple. Um, I was raised in North Las Vegas. I have $1.25 in my pocket. Well, uh, waiting in here is better than what is out there for me right now. Call it luck or call it fate, but either way, uh, I can say that somebody messed up really, really bad, and because of their mistake, I got my start. Until this day, I consider uh, being left in the cubicle one of the biggest blessings uh, in my life. So I took the opportunity and I ran with it. Ten years later, uh, I had an excellent idea to open up my own place in January 2009. It was the best idea ever. Uh, not really, but fuck it. <laughs> uh, for the bartender who wants to open a bar, amazing, perfect. The conversation will probably start something like this. You met somebody through somebody that knows somebody who has a ton of money. <laughs> Next, she or he came to your bar. They were so impressed with the old fashioned you made them with seven different bidders and took third place in your local drink conference. <laughs> now, you were next up to opening the bar. Now comes the good stuff, your concept. You'll tell me how you want to open a place that has excellent food, great cocktails, amazing music. Then the conversation will probably move into the craft beer selection on where you'll tell me you'll carry anywhere between 70 and uh, 700 beers you sourced from the local village surrounding the city that you grew up in. After that comes the bitters conversation, and last but not least, the amazing ice program that's gonna make the ABR look like a joke. <laughs> this is where you drop the bottle on me and tell me uh, what is going to set your bar apart from the rest. This bar is not gonna be like any other bar, because this bar is not gonna be stuffy, because you're gonna perform all of this out of a dive bar. Uh, <laughs> that's my letter, have a good one. So, uh, if this offends you, uh, let me stop you there. Uh, most importantly, let me stop myself. I'll begin by saying I'm not here to destroy your dreams. Quite the opposite. I'm telling you, you can do whatever makes you happy. If what I just said already, uh, if what I just said already makes you change your direction of what you were thinking of because of a simple and horrible paragraph like the one above, well, uh, then let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Let's focus on something more important than opening a bar or being a great bartender, or whatever it is that you try to accomplish. Let's start off by asking ourselves the most important question in life. Am I happy? Seems like a very easy question. We live in a world today where people base their self-esteem on the opinions of others. This mentality is dangerous, and I encourage you to veer away from it. I'm simply going to give you some of the things that have worked for me, and which in return has brought me great joy and eventually great success. Begin by looking in the mirror. I don't just mean go stand in front of a mirror. I mean, <laughs> genuinely look at yourself, who you are as a person, and evaluate yourself. Tell yourself everything you love about yourself, but most importantly, tell yourself everything uh, that you hate about yourself. And then truly work on it. Don't act like you're working on it. Don't brag about working on it. Don't just sit there and tell people you're working about it. Don't delay on working on it. Get off your ass and actually do it. Ideas without progress are simply ideas. I suggest you do this every single day. Secondly, stop acting like you're too cool to love. Understand the true meaning of love and what love is. It is easy to love something or somebody for everything that it is great at. We hear it all the time. That bartender is really fast, really good in the service well, that bartender looks really good. Uh, the bartender has a great attitude. But that's not what true love is. True love is loving something or somebody for everything that they are not. Give them the motivation and give them as much motivation that they are willing to give themselves. Cut all negativity out of your life. Do not live in a shade gray. The best gift I've ever given to myself is me at 100%. To continue, blame nobody but yourself for the direction that your life is going. You are in control. We all have choices in life. Uh, and they may not be choices that we like, a lot of times, but we do have choices. All of us have trials and tribulations. While you go through these things, uh, while you go through these things, 
you have a choice on how to build or destroy yourself. For me, life is like a bag of tools. You can choose to build or destroy, but never forget that you can always rebuild when you destroy. I know this firsthand. Um, I am where I am today because of the mistakes that I have made. Um, whatever. <laughs> I'm here so happy to uh, say. The mistakes that I have made and the way that I have learned from them. Stop basing the timeline of your success. Um, stop basing the, the, the timelines of your goals on the success of others. Success or succeed at your own pace. Um, and succeed at a pace that you are happy with. Never rush your artistry. Let it grow and flow organically. It is better to build one item to the best of your ability with clarity and passion than several uh, that are rushed and not up to par. This also creates exclusivity. It is important to understand that you have a voice. A voice that speaks calmly can be more heard than a voice that yells. Use your voice to motivate, inspire, and change lives. Don't just do what is best for you, do what is best for the world. To change the world, we must change ourselves. Understand that there are people that look up to you. So when you use your voice, understand that it is motivating others. Understand that if you speak negatively and hatefully, the people that you motivate will follow that. All voices are heard, some more than others, but just because something will give you fame and fortune does not make it right. I want to circle back around to what I said. If you look in the mirror and ask yourself, are you happy um, as an individual and what you are doing in the world? If you are happy with the way that you are making decisions, uh, if you are being productive in the world, and if this exact moment in time uh, you are not, that's perfectly fine and okay. The good news is this is, ex is the exact moment now. Here, right now, this is the perfect time to start. From here on out, make all the moves you make actually count. Most importantly, be patient and understanding of all your surroundings. I really want to bring this up, especially in our industry now. Stop talking over people. It is easy for you to give an opinion on a situation that you are not dealing with or going through yourself. Everybody has an opinion on something that they are not going through. Do not live that way. Once again, take a step back. Open your ears and your heart. Be compassionate to the problems at hand. Offer help to the best of, the, uh, to the best of your ability. Most importantly, if you yourself is the one that needs help, ask for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Lastly, um, don't just think outside of the box. Stand outside the box. Be open-minded. Be kind to each other. Respect each other. Love each other. But most importantly, love yourself. Seek fulfillment and happiness for yourself, and you will find true success um, is uh, with you every single day of your life. It has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with opening a bar. Being a great bartender, being anything. Happiness lies with you, and that's where you'll find your greatest form of success. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Tyler Mendoza. Um, father of two beautiful daughters, Alexis Lorraine and uh, Emily Mendoza. Owner of Curves and Rye, uh, as well as Cleaver, uh, but most importantly, recovering drug addict and alcohol. process of you know what you've done in your life and so on and um, yeah well done thank you for that uh, Bridget uh, you're up next my love all right cool so my my letter is called I didn't know we even have titles to the letters so mine's called um, just a small town girl <laughs> get the world and I took I it, it and I it anywhere so that's it's what it's called it is, I, I can sing it for you yeah, okay. okay so so dear young self I write this letter to you while sitting on the porch of my home in Shorewood, Illinois. This is a village I grew up in. I still enjoy the ride from the big city of Chicago back to the countryside after work. The ride is a symbol of a greater journey that began rooted in the past, my past, here in Shorewood. This train ride is a reminder to honor where you come from. Honor your beginnings, your roots, and let this foundation be your compass. You must go back to move forward. 
Never forget the days when everything was new and there were so many mistakes to learn from. When he wanted nothing more but to get out of that small town. Don't take your beginnings for granted. There are important lessons there. And if you don't learn from them, you'll become a know-it-all. Don't be that person. Someday, you might want to return to that small town. Experience life. For God's sake, put down your damn phone. And keep yourself open to learning by doing. This will allow you to experience some amazing things, but you must be ready, engaged, and present. Stay humble. Your mentors are the humblest people. Watch, listen, learn, and respect them. They've been doing this much longer than you. And this industry is much bigger than you, and it certainly doesn't revolve around you. It's about your customer's experience and the memory you're creating for them. It's not about how many cocktail competitions you win or fancy titles. Don't forget this, please. For God's sakes, go to bed. <laughs> you can't stockpile sleep, meaning you can't sleep 12 hours one night and run on that the rest of the week. I encourage you to protect your sleep at a younger age so this becomes a lifetime habit. Don't try to do it all. FOMO is real. Fuck it. Fuck FOMO. You're in this for longer than just this event, just this seminar, just this tasting, or just this party. There will be lots of opportunities for fun, I promise. Best way not to burn out is to protect your sleep. Inspire yourself. There will be times when you'll need to do creative work and your creative bank will be completely empty. Go outdoors in nature, travel, visit museums. Do something artistic that makes you uncomfortable. Commit to this and do it often. Absorb these experiences and write them down so you remember them. This is how to make inspiration maintainable and accessible when you need it the most, when you're going to. Your strongest source of inspiration is inside you. Remember, you're in the hospitality business. You're going to work and serve all sorts of different people in the bar. Some people will like you. That's what some won't. And what other people think of you is none of your goddamn business. <laughs> Let it go. Do this to protect your spirit during your shift. Don't bring it home because you're going to become worrisome and miserable. There's no room for complacency in the beverage industry. Keep moving. You can't make hard work in this industry. When you see a need, fill it. Always ask the question. The worst thing that will happen is that you're told no. But man, when you get that yes, doors will open for you, take the chance. And when you're not sure, man, that's okay too. Take a moment, listen to your gut, and plan, and then go for it. And please don't use drugs or drink too much, please. It's cool to say no thank you to drugs. Or to that next drink that you know is going to put you over the edge. Too many bartenders and beverage professionals that have come before you are no longer here to share this lesson. Be the bartender that looks out for their friend that's abusing drugs and alcohol. Don't be afraid to say, I'm here for you, to listen, to help you. Your friend may not listen. Keep trying. Be kind to yourself. This is not going to be easy. But you can do it. Listen to your body. Eat foods that will nourish you. Sit at a table and eat. <laughs> Find exercise that brings you happiness. Ride a bike, run, or dance. But love yourself first. Love your industry. Love the people in your life more. <coughs> Family and friends matter. Make friends outside of the beverage industry. And please date people that never made a drink or serve <laughs> <laughs> In the world, see what happens, okay? Make your family and friends a priority. 
Allow them to be your soft place to land and where you find your joy. This industry is going to want every single thing from you. And at the same time, it's going to give you so much. And it's going to be real easy to let it consume you physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So keep in mind, there's so much more to life than you're getting. And the more you're going to be exposed to in this industry, the more you're going to realize how little you know about the industry. And that's fine. Just keep learning and do your best. Now, take what's useful from my letter, please, and leave behind what's not. Um, I believe in all you. I believe in myself. who I've known since I was actually 18. He used to actually sing Rolling Stones songs to me in the canteen. <laughs> I mean, this guy. Can I please introduce myself? Uh, I told you, he told you. My name is Douglas Sankra. Man, this is when I was asking this about a few months ago. I didn't know where to start. This is a very, very long journey for me. Um, for me, it was a mistake. Working in bars and restaurants. I first started in the Hard Rock Cafe as a bad act. You know, I did not want to be seven people and so on and so forth. I was told not to even give my parents. Yeah. So True, right? I like serving, I like being making new friends. I've made so many mistakes in the past, if I told you, you would have grabbed me. <laughs> it's been so many mistakes. My title of my letter is very personal of my journey. Um, Nearly about 40 years ago, not that old, you know, I've been for a long time. My journey starts in West Africa in Ghana when I came to the UK at the age of 11, 12. Okay? And being an immigrant in the UK, so you, you can you speak. Can my lamp you read. <laughs> oh, yes, I, uh, I take that off if I'm like so. <laughs> uh, As I said, I've made so many bad mistakes in the past. It's crazy. You know? When we first got our bar uh, in London, Soho, we didn't bring it to the bars. You know, the most important thing as a bartender, talking about the barrel, is reading between the lines. But most of all, making friends who are not in the industry, you know, lawyers, doctors, and so forth. Right. Setting up yourself for success. Title of my, my, my letter to you guys, or my younger self. Okay. My pet thoughts are very, very good for yours. First and foremost, if you're going to open a bar, stakes are be a business, you know, plan, and most of all, this is terrible for me to do at this time. I hate doing this. I know, I told you. Yeah, this, this is hard, way more tough, but I do my best to get through this. Okay. It's, uh, sorry, again. Okay. So, it's trying to open a bar, you need to set yourself up for success. A business plan, a team, but most of all partners. You cannot do it alone. Okay? Trying to run a business alone is the most difficult thing. And I've tried so many times and failed so many times. You need to have a team um, that you work with, uh, as I said, lawyers, and uh, bring you to an alliance. Secondly, developing your brand. Okay? How do you take your little brainchild to an audience? First and foremost, you know, you've got to have a location. Secondly, you've got to have a team to work with. Okay? Now, managing your life. Okay? For me, health is the most important thing away from bars. About 10 years ago, I had a stroke. Um, and I had to take time out from work. Three years. Right. When you work in bars, restaurants, and so forth, it's all about drinking, drugs, and men. I've done all of those. And I was from one party, and I did that. We lost probably identified. We play hard, and the more hard you play, the more people think you're cool, which is not cool, right? Now, when we first opened Lab, about, I think, 20 years ago, right? Yep. Um, we didn't have a license. And we paid rent for whole two years because we didn't read. We didn't do any better. 
day, and we went bankrupt three or four times. If I had known what I know now, you know, I would have read that between the lines, ensuring that those things don't care. Okay? Now, Wow, what do I start again? Uh, <laughs> guys, I need your help. This is very, very personal. It's very, very hard to do. You know, when you have all your peers here, man, it's the most difficult thing to do. Be honest. Don't sleep. Don't fall asleep. Wake up. <laughs> so it's a good thing. Um, for me, working in bars is what I'm good at. Okay? And about two or three years ago, I decided to start my own brand. Called the Paul Star Martini. How do you monetize what you create and try to take it across local markets or globally? You know? um, yeah. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's Douglas. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Dale. Yes. Um, okay. This is called A Note from the World's Best Bartender. <laughs> Dear Young Master DeGroff, you're not the world's best bartender. Over the years, beginning in the late 1980s, I garnered a lot of attention in the press, both electronic and print, because of my association with a man named Joe Baum. Genius, who was one of the visionaries who changed the way we eat and drink in America. The association raised my profile as a public person. When the, when the press called, I actually answered the phone. A lot of bartenders would have just blown them off in those days. But once you help a couple of writers who are always past deadline, <laughs> your name gets on the list. And my heightened profile in the press, both all couple types. The concept of a bar dedicated to reviving pre-prohibition pre 19th century style of drinking, along with the classics associated with that era, did not go unnoticed by a bunch of young men and women around the country. Some already in the culinary arts, some in other occupations, who were casting about for a, for a future profession. I made it okay, even attractive to be a professional bartender again. I know there are parents around the United States gunning for this guy, Dale DeGroff, whose children dropped out of law school and pre-med and <laughs> wonderful liberal arts programs and colleges just to be a bartender. <laughs> I did, I left the University of Rhode Island in 1969, but not become a bartender. I was enrolled in the theater arts studying dance and voice and acting. I appeared in a play, a cutting edge new playwright named Lamford Wilson at the Yale Drama Festival. <clears throat> was praised by a New York critic. I went back to the university, packed my bags, and I never looked back. Sure, I'd be on Broadway stage in no time. Actually, it's true. To this day, I've spent no time on a Broadway stage. <laughs> <laughs> my road to the bar was mm, Immediate in one sense, I didn't, it didn't take long to realize that life in New York City happened in the, in the neighborhood bars and in the fancy cocktail lounges. I mean, I, but I didn't actually end up working in a bar for a long time. I worked in a series of jobs. I packed Gideon Bibles, shop, shop, chipping to hotels. I, I put up posters overnight uh, at construction barriers. I worked as a moving man for Van Gogh Movers. Uh, for a guy, a clever guy, named Don French, who was my roommate, and eventually he bought his own trucks and he painted on the side of those trucks two guys holding up a big ear. Then go move it. It was very clever. <laughs> anyway, 1970, I was even a chauffeur for, and a personal assistant for Zsa Gabor when she was in town on Broadway doing 40 carats. And that's a story we don't have time to go into right now. <laughs> anyway, things broke for me when I went to work for an ad agency. One of my best friends, Older brother owned one. His name was Ron Holland. That changed my life forever. The ad guys were the smartest guys in the room and the funniest. And the TV show man, 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 man missed, in my opinion. They missed the humor and the intelligence that characterized the best creative minds sometimes 
in this advertising profession. Some were misogynists and cutthroats and scoundrels, but hey, <coughs> what's different? Any corporate office, even today, you find that. Uh, but some were consummate storytellers in a city full of stories. And man, I paid attention. Uh, I, I told those stories, you know. <clears throat> anyway, uh, eventually I, I ended up, and by the way, that's how I met Joe Obama. They had a, an account called Wrestling Associates, and eventually I met him, and he became my mentor. The notion that there is a best bartender, Dale, uh, in the world, as if it were some kind of competition, is silly. It's a job. I mean, and when it's done really well, it rises to the level of a craft. I stopped at an art. Although some people go there. I mean, the legendary bartenders of the 20th century, one of them, Frank Meyer from the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Frank wrote a book called The Artistry of Mixing Drinks. And was he the best? I mean, but what about his contemporary, Harry Craddock, exiled by prohibition from the United States, who wrote the Savoy Cocktail Book, one of the, one of the most important books post-prohibition, uh, historical cocktails and cutting-edge cocktails of the day. And I know countless proclamations of excellence for Harry McElhone, another man exiled who, from the United States, who opened Harry's New York Bar in Paris, a destination for every sort of person who enjoyed a, a, a warm welcome and a good drink, traveling in Paris. His book, The ABC of Mixing Cocktails, fit in your shirt pocket, and he dedicated a chapter to the drinks concocted by his regulars over the years, and they loved him for it. We can, we can still stop and have a Bloody Mary at Harry's Barn, and a hot dog, traveling in Paris. So what could the best mean? I mean, the fastest, the friendliest, uh, the biggest earner for the house, uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, popular among customers, the biggest social media following. Uh, who decides, anyway? Only the customers, really. Of course, their favorite son bartender who works down at the corner near Quick Joint is going to win and stout. Bartending is a complex set of jobs, all occurring simultaneously. But most important of all, these jobs is making some contact across that three feet of mahogany and bringing guests back night after night. Never lose track of the prime directive. To make people happy, bringing them back, and that can be difficult. Because making people happy changes with every person. I mean, giving uh, them what they want. Sure, but, well, that's tricky too. Uh, it may be that they don't even know what they want until you show them, or make it for them, or talk to them, or tell them the story. We're paid to make friends out of difficult people, and we have to do all of this with pleasure, speed, fun, and creativity. Ah, <laughs> but here's the rub. And we have to mix things with a high degree of deliciousness at the same time. Because you know what? Bartenders are members of the culinary profession, just like kitchen guys. They are, especially in the 21st century where we hear the cocktail profession has become intimate with the culinary profession and they've had a lot of love children. <laughs> anyway, prohibition almost capped our profession for sure, to use the gangster terminology. It was a pervasiveness, a pervasiveness, pervasiveness of organized criminal activity throughout the drinks industry that, that stuck to the profession like lint on a cheap wool suit. I mean, for decades after repeal, it was an unsavory business to be associated with. It was eventually, you know, anyway, there was a generation that came after the children of those guys and the grandchildren who wanted to bring the drinks profession back into the mainstream. Well, the 20th century, uh, 21st century, <laughs> hello, Dale, has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, anyway, and the 21st century cocktail bar with it. The cocktail has not seen a renaissance like this since the golden age in the 19th century. We know that we are witnessing a generation of highly skilled and, uh, and experts who are taking the craft to new places. Welcome to the 21st century bar. Something is missing in this equation, though. 
We're making 21st century drinks and cocktails on 19th century workstations. Where are you guys? We're going to design the 21st century workstations. Um, solve the design problems. I, I, I don't want to change the creature comforts out front for the guest's perspective. That's what made American bars so popular worldwide. But the workbench behind, behind that mahogany or zinc or marble, which was very comfortable, by the way, with a great grass rail and all that. We want that. Can you have one? But the traditions of the 19th century, they do remain intact and an integral part of our bar because, as witnessed by those of us who enjoy P.J. Clark and McSorley and Ole House and the Rich in Paris and 21 Club and on and on and on and on. We enjoy that old world charm. We, we, we indeed, I mean, we, the, the whole world still exists around us and thank God it does. It would, I would never imply that the classic watering mills are outdated or obsolete. The new cocktailians, thank you, Gaz Reagan, for defining <laughs> our community, embrace many of the old world traditions. The difference is they've grown up in a culture of internet access. They are well versed in global marketing as they are in bartending. They have a world of information at their fingertips and they can integrate the old world traditions with a heightened focus on recipe and, and ingredients and, and flavor. This education has brought a completely new dimension to the bar. I never thought about that when I was a bartender. Taste? <laughs> hey, what's that got to do with bartending? Uh, so anyway, we have some culinary profession. We have, we have, we're borrowing tools from the kitchen and techniques. We're, we're transforming the world of drinks. I look back at my first day at the Rainbow Room when I gathered 34 bartenders who I had hired, the original hires, 1987, I walked them through our beautiful, large hotel kitchen. Then we ended up going up the escalator. Yeah, we had an escalator to the dining room for the waiters with nine or 12 dinners on their shoulders. And we ended up in that beautiful cabaret nightclub called Rainbow and Stars, and we all sat down. And I said, I want you all to be chefs of your bar. We just walked past a bunch of professionals down there I want you to take it as seriously as those 27 people that we just walked past. Not a single one of those bartenders had a tool in their hands. Not even a knife. Anyway, they are consummate pros today. Some behind the bar, some running hotel beverage programs, food programs. And coming over here, I, I was thinking about the Brennan family, and specifically John Brennan, who founded, uh, actually really created the modern day uh, beautiful restaurant out there in the Garden District called Commander's Palace. About six or eight, ten years in, he had a couple of kids. He started a food packing business because he was tired of not ever being there at night when the kids were having dinner. I was never there at night with my two sons when we were having dinner. Never. In, in, in their whole childhood that I would sit down to dinner with my sons. This is something you must think about. What do you want to do with your life? You want to have a bunch of kids and do all that stuff? You have to think about that. Anyway, that's my letter. And by the way, if I'd known that Greg Goose was the was the sponsor, I would have charged a lot more money. Jesus oh. Christ. <laughs> Downstairs, you know, bright eyed bush and tell young bartender that I was I was a young bartender once. <laughs> Even though Jacob Ryers does remind me that I did bartend in the last millennia. Um, and I remember and I said, Dale, is there any advice that you could um, give someone um, like me starting out in the uh, industry? And he said, Yeah, make sure you carry uh, a nail clipper and always make sure that your nails are clipped. And to this day, to I mean, this day. I carry a nail clipper. I always clip my nails before I go to work. It's insane. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, it's a little thing, but it makes a massive difference. Yeah, because I remember whenever I go to bars to judge bartenders in bartender competitions, I, or, or whenever anyone's making me a cocktail, I always look at their hands. Your hands, your nails ain't tight, the cocktail ain't tight. So I'll kind of like, you know, step back a little bit. But 
Um, there's something that I've read, actually, um, and it was um, when it came to mentorship. Uh, the reason uh, why you're all able to see the furthest is because you stand on the shoulder of, of giants. And um, I want to actually just say a personal thank you to Adele from all of us uh, for allowing us to all stand on your shoulders, sir, because you are definitely one of those uh, people that helped shape the industry as we all see today. We all hear. <laughs> You've got pretty big shoulders to stand on. Unfortunately, um, we've got to leave this room. We don't have um, any time for questions. But um, we have a Facebook page, Letters of the Young Bartenders Facebook page. Um, I'm going to post all of these letters up there over the next couple of weeks. If you've got anything that you want to ask, please post the questions on that page, and I'll ensure that um, everyone comes back uh, to you with uh, a reply. Um, but listen, thank you all very much for your time. Enjoy yourselves at, at Tales. Get involved. And get involved, bruv. Thank you. And don't forget, today's National Rum Day as well. And we're going to start off at the Angela King Gallery at 3 o'clock. So get over there for some rum daiquiris. Join us in celebrating an amazing day and activity here in Tales. So thank you all very much. For